Rise and body our spirit for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all of the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and heal all, healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. Uh, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. And woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Christ. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> And then Jesus gathered his disciples upon the plain, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are they that thirst for justice. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. Blessed are you when you suffer. Be glad and rejoice, for your reward is great in heaven. And then Simon Peter said to him, Are we supposed to know this? And Andrew said, do I have to write this down? And Philip said, I, I don't have any paper. And Bartholomew said, are we going to have to turn this in? And James said, are we going to have a test on this? And John said, hey, the other disciples didn't have to learn this. And Matthew said, I've got the bathroom. And Judas said, what does this have to do with real life? And then one of the Pharisees who was present asked to see Jesus' lesson plans and inquired of Jesus, where is your anticipatory set and your objectives in the cognitive domain? And Jesus wept. <laughs> you know, I guess by nature we're all a little suspicious. Maybe it's our age, maybe it's our heritage. Maybe it's too many after Christmas sales, too many New Year's promises, too many Groundhog Days, I don't know. But whatever it is, there seems to be something that makes one grow suspicious, especially when we hear news that just sounds to be a bit too good to be true. How about you? I mean, do you ever find yourself a little bit leery uh, of things that just seem to be too good to be true? Think about your life. But in so doing, move beyond the Christ, after Christmas bargain sales and the predictions of Groundhog Day. Move beneath all the superficial stuff. And move on down to the more personal matters. It's okay. You can do it here. You can do that in the privacy of this place. Do you ever find yourself just a little bit suspicious about matters related to your Christian faith? Oh, yeah, it all started so simply, didn't it? Births, baptisms, weddings, blessings seem so fine when they start, but then we look around and we wonder why so many bad things happen to good people. Why do teenagers rebel, especially around the 7th, 8th, and 9th grades? Why do our marriages lose their luster? Why do parents die? 
Why do friends get cancer? And And we begin to wonder why. Why death? Why suffering? Why illness? Why isn't life as a Christian better than all this? Man, it all seems so simple on that starry, starry night when a little child was born in Bethlehem. But then the secret questions started to grow. And the subtle suspicions became a little bit more doubt. Where is the good news to be found? Is this all there is to life? I mean, let's be honest here. Suspicion is ever-present in the life of a Christian. Faith is a struggle even in normal times, and we ain't in normal times right now. And when it comes to death, well, our thoughts double, right? Now, before we start the Lutheran Church and the Holy Pity Party here, let's look around us. Because if we stop to look around, we'll find that we are not alone. In fact, we find that we're in pretty good company. And when we look around, we find out that you and I, we're not that different. We're not much different than even those first Christians who gathered at the church in, in the Corinth. Time and time and time again, Paul had to remind them of the good news of the gospel. Time and time and time again, Paul had to remind them where the good news in life was to be found. And yep, time and time and time again, Paul had to tell them to knock it off with a big pity party. Listen again to what Paul says in his opening line. He said, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, just how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? I mean, That wasn't anything new. That wasn't the first time that the Corinthians had heard this. Just a few verses earlier, Paul set the record straight. In verses 1 through 4, he said, Now I would remind you, uh, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, and in which also you stand, and through which also you are being saved. If if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you. Well, that is, unless you've come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I had first of all received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with all of our scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Jesus was born, he said. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. And then Jesus was risen from the dead. I mean, you can't say it more clearly than that. But in spite of the clear proclamation of the good news, their, their suspicions, they all started to kind of creep in. Apparently, there were those in the church in Corinth who were satisfied to believe only in Jesus. But they just weren't too sure about that whole resurrection stuff. Especially if the resurrection even applied to them. I mean, it just sounded too good to be true. I mean, the Christian story, it sounded so simple when it started, didn't it? Young woman gets pregnant. Baby is born, sleeps in a manger, star appears in the sky, shepherds watch their sheep, angels sing in a silent night, wise men visit from the east, and yes, all that other romantic Christmas stuff. It just sounded so simple. People are even amused when a 12-year-old boy wanders off from his parents and speaks in a temple. Ah, but then Jesus grows up. But even then, the man Jesus is acceptable. He was a good guy. I mean, he turned water into wine at a wedding, right? He went fishing with the disciples, caught a whole big boatload of fish. He said a lot of nice, pithy things, helped a lot of people along all that. But this resurrection thing, man, I just don't know. It all just sounds a bit much. And then to be told that we too have the promise of new life in Christ, hey, come on. We've all been taught anything too good to, that sounds too good to be true is usually too good to be true. But Paul, he pulls no punches. He, he says, quote, 
if, if there is no resurrection from the dead, well, then obviously Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And uh, your faith has been in vain. I mean, we might even be misrepresenting God if the dead are not raised, because then Christ has not been raised. Now, wait a minute there, Paul. You know, you mean we can't just stop at Christmas? You know, the, the happy, happy, joy, joy stuff of Christmas? Well, Paul says no. He says to do so would be, mis- to, be to misrepresent God. That our faith would be futile if that only means that we're born and we struggle and then we die. I mean, is that all there is to the Christian life? Paul, again, he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith has been futile. And you are still in your sins because for this life only we have hoped in Christ. Well, then we are the most to be pitied. You know, Paul says it would be pitiful if we live only to be born, to struggle and to die. What a pity, he says, if there is no good news of new life in Christ. What a pity to live a life with such a futile faith. But the Christian life leaves no room for self-pity. I mean, Paul is almost shouting when he sounds forth the final line of today's second reading, quote, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Yes, there it is, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the good news that is almost too good to be true. Yes, Jesus was born. Yes, Jesus lived. Yes, Jesus died, but he was also raised from the dead. And you and I, we all share in that very same good news. We too, of course, are born. We, of course, live, and we too someday will die. And we too have a new life in Jesus Christ. No, there is no room for self-pity among those who have new life in Christ and our, because our gospel today says it so well when it quotes Jesus, when he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, because you're going to laugh. Now, I don't know about you, but I need to hear and I need to experience that good news story over and over and over and over again, because in that message there is a new life in Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ our Lord is heard and experienced as the people of God gather together right here week after week after week. Each and every week we can hear of God's forgiveness. Each and every week we can share our suspicions and hear of God's word. Each and every week we gather as the people of God not only to hear the good news, but we also get to experience it. We get to, we get to smell it. We get to taste it. We get to swallow it. The good news truly becomes a part of us when the body of Christ is given for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you. Yes, even in these suspicious days of angry politics and Christmas sales and New Year's promises and Groundhog Days and we hear news that sounds almost too good to be true. But not only do we hear it, we take it with us until we meet again. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we're going to face challenges and we're going to face difficulties in the course of our lives. And no, we will not always be full or laughing or spoken well of. But that certainly does not mean our lives will be overwhelmed by pain or challenges because we are all a people of faith. We are a people that believe in the resurrection. We are a people who believe that the love of God is stronger than anything in this world, even the power of death. 
After all, as it says in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble in its tumult. Yes, as a people of faith, we can choose to trust in God. We can choose to seek out our blessings. We can choose to live our lives with gratitude. We can choose to follow the example of all the saints in our lives and those who have been examples of hope and strength for us. By choosing to define our lives by joy and by blessing rather than by pain and by loss. Oh, yeah. Sure, challenges are going to come. But it is by holding fast to our faith, holding fast to our hope, holding fast to the ever-present reality of the love and the blessings in our lives can we overcome all of those challenges. My family of faith, the world needs people whose lives are defined not by pain and loss, but by love and by blessings. Yes, the world needs more blessings. So let us now give thanks on this, the sixth Sunday of the Epiphany, for all of those in our lives who have shown us just what it is to bless the world with their lives. And then let us all go forth and do likewise. Amen.